Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And this week, we're going to be talking about double-edged knives. Uh, These are the double-edged knives I have in my collection uh, which, you know, obviously it's a sub-collection, and uh, hopefully we see that sub-collection grow this year. Uh, I've got my eye on a number of double-edged knives uh, coming up here this year, and, uh, you know, if if uh, if I can maintain that interest long enough to get them, uh, I'll come out with a pretty sweet uh, collection of daggery type things on the end. We're also going to talk about a new knife from Wee from Justin Lundquist, uh, a new consistent angle sharpener from WorkSharp, and a couple of new fox knives, a couple that really uh, strum a chord with me. You'll see why. Uh, but first, let's get to a pocket check. It's the it's the icebreaker. It's the way to to to. It's the first good excuse to show off a knife. So today, I'm carrying my zero tolerance zero four six zero. Uh, 0640. Sorry about that. Uh, This is an Ernest Emerson design based on his Viper model. As you can see, it's one of the few uh, Emerson designs that is waveless um, uh, from the get-go, actually. This this never had a wave. Now, some Emerson knives were designed initially with a wave, and then there are models with the wave taken off, and vice versa, initially designed without a wave, and then a wave added. This knife or the Viper, the original knife that this was based on, never had a wave. Uh, to me, this knife is its kind of in the same category as a Sebenza or, or something like that. It's sort of plain, sort of um, unassuming, but powerful and, and, and uh, well, rugged and just classic in its look. It doesn't have too much contouring. It doesn't have too much in the way of crazy shapes. It's just sort of a classic folder. And uh, this one comes with the barf green carbon fiber. I, I replaced that uh, with these um, natural tan micarta handle scales. Uh, as far as carbon fiber goes, I actually did not mind the, I, I used to call it split pea soup carbon fiber. I didn't mind it so much. It's just carbon fiber in general, that sort of that sort of regular weave. Eh, doesn't do it for me. So I just got that. You know, micarta does it for me. Uh, second knife I'm carrying today was a gift from the great and powerful Doug Ritter. And this is his uh, design. This is the Mini RSK Mark I. Uh, So, you know, this is the Ritter grip as made by Hogue. I hate to put it that way. Uh, But Hogue has been really knocking it out of the park with these. Sorry for the sports analogy. You won't hear me say that much, but uh, there you go. It's got this beautiful purple... G Mascus, so it's a G10, uh, layered with three different colors, black, purple, and a light gray. And then as they contour the handle, you can see it's rounded. As they contour the handle and then mill in the um, uh, the sunburst pattern in there, it reveals the different layers and you get that beautiful sort of, uh, well, that mixed color effect. Um, this is a really excellent, excellent knife. If you have any reservations about, um, whether you should get one of these or a, or a griptilian or or whatever, just know that this knife here, um, the handle is ever so slightly longer than a, than a Benchmade uh, mini griptilian. And the blade is a little bit broader and thinner and it has a higher, um, higher flat grind. This thing is very, very extremely slicey. And I don't mean to take anything away from the, from the Benchmade gri- griptilian. Those are great knives too. Uh, but if you've ever thought that the handle on the mini griptilian was just a little bit too small, this one makes up for it with that uh, little bit in the end where the where the lanyard hole is. Deep carry pocket clip. I always thought that Hogue's pocket clips were maybe a uh, one millimeter too thin. I don't know. I thought the ga- I've always thought the gauge of the metal that they use for their clips is just a little light. Not that I've ever had a problem with it, um, but well, you take that for what it's worth. So uh, that's what I'm carrying today, and I'm sticking with it because I don't believe in the wardrobe change. Uh, very rarely do I switch knives in the middle of the day. Uh, I feel like the knife, since I have s- quite a number of them and I rotate them, I, I feel like um, I should have a full day with a knife once I, once I finally select it. 
All right, probably more than you need to know. Uh, but uh, before we move on to Life Knife News, I want to do a little show and tell. I, <laughs> uh, I had to move some stuff. I moved the lady painting behind me and put it over to my right. And uh, when I did that, I had to move a couple of knives off the wall. Now, these have been on the wall so long, I sort of forgot they were there. I just want to show them off real quick before they go into the archives, because I think these are going to be going in the drawer. This first one is a knife that I made, well, years and years and years ago. I must have been in like seventh or eighth grade, something like this. And I, I, I made it from a kit, obviously. Um, uh, my good friend Mike got one and uh, made his, and then I... I man, I had to get one. And, uh, you know, you, you, you sort of weave the sheath together. It's a nice, nice sheath. And then you get this blade and, uh, and the handle, you get everything. You just basically screw it together. So I rediscovered this a few years ago, put it up on my wall and then forgot about it until yesterday or a couple days ago. And, uh, I really like this knife and I wonder how actually sturdy it is, you know? Um, it's got the construction of a, of a bygone era. This is like early 80s uh, or, you know, mid 80s, I guess. And I'm just wondering, is this thing any good as a knife? Not that I'm going to take it out and use it or anything, but how far could you take this old kit knife? It's really solid, but that could be because it's never been used. Um, so found that. I love that. And it would be cool to have a Bowie knife that looks just like this with the same sort of profile that that nice deeply scalloped clip that, that extends almost halfway up the blade. You've got a real broad blow, uh, Bowie blade here, Bowie blade, and a squared off handle. Now it's not quite a coffin handle, a coffin shaped handle uh, is squared, but it swells out towards the end. Uh, this is just kind of a rectangular handle. And for anyone who's ever watched Forged in Fire or has swung a knife or a sword at something solid, you definitely want a more rectangular handle than you do a round handle because the rounded handles, uh, the more circular they are in cross-section, the more apt they are to roll on you when you make an impact with the edge. So I rediscovered that knife. And then this one here, this knife was made by Adam Porras of Recovery Forge. He was one of the first interviews we did here on the show. Now he's local to me here in Virginia and he's got this, um, he's got a forge where he um, invites veterans, combat veterans and, and the like to come and for free, they can learn how to forge a knife. And for my job, I did a little video piece on him a few years back and uh, I spent the day there with me and uh, two cameramen and uh, we made this, we meaning he made this. And, uh, you know, took this from a, from a lump of steel and turned it into a knife. Now, um, you know, we were, we were somewhat rushed and it was, uh, you know, meant for TV. So it's, it's not exactly gonna win many beauty contests, but it's functional. And to me, it reminds me a little bit of that, that classic American design, the roach belly, which you can see uh, uh, Cold Steel makes a, one of their very inexpensive sort of camp knife versions of the roach belly. Um, this kind of has that, that same look. This knife, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, what am I, what am I trying to say? This, this knife has a lot of sentimental value to me because of the experience of making it and the gentleman who, who made it and, and what he's doing, helping veterans kind of uh, deal with PTSD uh, by having them come and, learn how to forge knives. I just think it's very, very cool. You should check out that interview um, and, uh, and, and hear about what he's all about. So these, I believe, will be going into the archive for a while as I put other things up on the wall. I'm going to take advantage of this expanded wall space behind me now that I have the, the smaller logo up there and uh, yeah, see if I can fit a couple other knives in there. So... That's what we got there. So listen, before we move on to knife life, knife life news, man, I've been doing this for two and a half years almost now, and I still can't get knife life news. I always conflate the words. In any case, before we get there, I just want to talk about Patreon for a quick second and remind you of what you get. Uh, um, Patreon, as you know, is a way for, well, uh, viewers 
and listeners to patron uh, patronize the the show by giving us money to help us with our server costs and such. Uh, but you get something out of this too. You get your name mentioned on the show. You get stickers, and if you go th to the very uh, top tier, which is the ten dollar gentleman junkie uh, level, you get entered into a weekly knife giveaway. So if you think it's worth it, join us on Patreon. There's also exclusive content. Uh, you get access to the interviews days earlier, and you get access to this show days earlier too. So there's a, um, and there's also a, uh, a Patreon knife sale coming up that was uh, suggested by Blade Ogre. Blade, it's coming, I swear. I swear. I just have to be able to get rid of a couple of these knives. Uh, but anyway, uh, check us out on Patreon. Join us there. We would love to have you. And now, Knife Life News. Okay. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So the first story in our Knife Life News uh, today is about a knife coming out from a, from a knife maker that I have not yet had anything from him yet. This is Justin Lundquist we're talking about. And he has a new knife coming out from Wii this year called the Eidolon. And that's how I'm going to pronounce it. E I D O L O N. Okay, it's a it's a beautiful little knife. But first of all, I had to look it up. What does this word mean, Eidolon? And it is a an ancient Greek term for a um, sort of a phantom, a, a ghost of someone who might be alive or might be dead. You see this sometimes in like the Odyssey um, when he goes into the underworld. Odysseus not only meets dead people, but he meets a couple of people who are still alive. Uh, so that's what an Eidolon is. Um, but if you look at this knife, it looks all just in Lundquist. Uh, to me, it's it's somewhat reminiscent, but not derivative, of the Feist, the Kaiser Feist. I think that was Kaiser's first front flipper and a very successful knife. Uh, this Eidolon uh, is is really unique and beautiful in that it's it's got no hardware on the outside except for the pivot. It is really sleek and really simple. It'll be coming with two different blade shapes, a, uh, a single-edged dagger shape, and then uh, a sort of drop point come um, a curved Warncliffe kind of. And very much in the tradition of, of uh, Justin Lundquist's designs, uh, CPM 20 CV steel and G10. And the blade is about uh, three inches, 2.8 inches, and it comes in at 2.3 ounces. Now, uh, I want to talk about 20CV for a quick second. I've been mentioning this recently, but it, it occurs to me that the place it's most important to have these super steels is on this kind of knife, this sort of little EDC knife, because these are the kind of knives that you carry with you all the time and that you actually use. You know, I have 20CV on a couple of large bladed folders that I barely use uh, because, um, well, because... In, in a lot of cases, the smaller knife will do the trick better or I'm at work or something and I can't. So to me, having 20 CV or M390 or something like that on a smaller blade makes the most sense because you're gonna have it, you're gonna use it a lot, um, but it's not gonna get that real tough workout. Uh, so you could essentially have a knife like this Eidolon in 20 CV steel and never sharpen it if you're just you know using it for light tasks and stuff. So, um, I don't know. I'm uh, lately. I'm I'm really liking the super steels on the small knives, and this 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 little honey is, it's beautiful. I really, you know, if you said to me, "Oh, it's got no hardware," showing, I'd be like, "Okay, big deal." But just in looking at it, something about it, that clean look, is just very appealing. So, look for this uh, the Adelon coming from Wee Knife uh, and designed by Justin Lundquist. He's got a bunch of knives coming out this year from. Uh, from a number of different manufacturers, uh, uh, Kaiser, Concept, Boker, Urban EDC Supply, and right here, We Knife. So uh, Justin Lundquist is blowing up. Check it out. All right, next, I just wanted to, to mention quickly that um, WorkSharp, the people at WorkSharp, have come out with a consistent angle sharpener, very much in the tradition of uh, the KME if you will. So it's, uh, well, you can see it right there. Your, your blade clamps into it on the, uh, on, on the base of the thing, there is a adjustable height uh, range finder basically that gets you exactly the angle you want. 
and then you just slide the um, the stone up and down the blade and it keeps it at a consistent angle. Now, this is coming in at under $100. If you've ever seen some of the other consistent angle uh, uh, sharpeners, they're, they can run you, they can run you into the $400 range. I mean, they can get very, very expensive. So this is a kind of a revolution in that sort of scene. Uh, and by scene, I mean, in the consistent angle sharpener uh, scene, if you can call it that. So look at this. So, so when you're done sharpening one side and you feel the burr, you flip it over very much like my KME, and then you go back at it on the other side. It looks like it's got a very sturdy plastic base and there is um, a feature in the clamp that allows you to each time put the knife in exactly the same way. And the what I mean by that is sometimes, especially with a fully flat ground blade, when you're clamping it into one of those clamps, it can be sketchy as to whether it's exactly uh, perpendicular to the, the base of the sharpener. There's a special notch cut out in this clamp that allows it to each time, even with fully flat to ground blades, to, to get that lock consistent each time. So that if you put a 20 degree edge on it, you're not worried about whether the knife itself is in the right position. The knife itself will be in the right position. It's a matter of you getting the right angle. So look for that new consistent angle sharpener from WorkSharp. What are they calling this thing? Mm. Uh, WorkSharp Precision Adjust, I think it's called. Work sharp, oh, try abrasive and pivot. I don't, well, you can see what it's called right there. Precision adjust knife sharpener. Yeah. So uh, it should be should be cool. I think, um, you know, they, they say that it's the perfect solution for the people who are hesitant to sharpen their knives because it guides you in such a way that you can't really mess it up. But it's also geared towards people who you know, know how to sharpen and, and know what they want in terms of their high performance edges. So it's, it's the panacea for everybody, apparently. Looking forward to that. Uh, next, Fox Knives. Now, they have a very, um, excuse me, I'm very thirsty today. I keep going for this water. They have a new lineup coming out in 2021 that is very, very designer heavy. And uh, I love that. Uh, I love when great companies like Fox who produce high quality knives do uh, collaborations with designers whose knives ordinarily uh, would be out of reach. But this year I wanted to mention uh, Fox knives because they have two knives from Black Rock knives, which is Ken Vehikite. He was on our show a couple weeks back. Um, they have a couple of his knives coming out and one of them is this. This is my custom uh, Black Rock knives monkey thumper. Um, since it is custom, I ordered, you know, the, the kind of handle I wanted uh, in terms of color and I ordered a, a double edged, uh, and the like, but Fox is producing a, uh, uh, production version of it. And I am happy for the world because this is a super cool design and it carries beautifully. It's the only knife I carry in the scout, uh, position upside down in the scout position works great. Uh, but also, I'm I'm thrilled for Ken because uh, Ken Vehikite has been has been knocking it out of the park with his beautiful designs and execution, and um, you know he's made this his life and he's uh, he's raising a family doing this, and now he's got so much greater exposure. So I'm I'm happy for him and I'm happy for the people who might want a monkey thumper but don't want to pay the money for a custom, uh, like a guy a friend of mine at work. Uh, second knife. Uh, that they're coming out with is the Ryu. And the Ryu is uh, based on, on the, um, the ancient Japanese Tanto design. And when I say ancient Japanese, what I'm referring to is that, maybe that's not the right way to say it actually, but uh, the traditional Tanto design or Quaken. And I don't know if I, I said or Quaken as if they are the same thing. And technically I'm not sure, but what I'm getting at is this. It's not an Americanized Tanto where you have that faceted tip and that uh, sub point like this knife here. This is just the, uh, the gentle upward slope of a traditional Japanese um, uh, Tanto. And I think this one's very cool. This might be one that I end up getting just uh, not only to help 
I'm doing this to help support Ken. So I'm just going to buy this. But also, I, you know, I might be moving into a Tanto phase at some point, and I'd like to be well armed with this before that happens. Uh, I like that uh, skull crusher butt cap. It looks like you could actually put your thumb over it, but I don't know, might be a little too pointy. That's always my my stopping point with the skull crushers. It's got nice jimping. And in this particular model, you've got that uh, totally acceptable marbled carbon fiber and that beautiful Damascus blade or Damascus blade. So uh, yeah, look for the new lineup from Fox Knives uh, coming in 2021. And uh, I might say, Really check out these Ken Vahikite knives and check him out on Instagram, Black Rock Knives. Very, very cool stuff. Um, so, state of the collection. Let's go to the state of the collection. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. This weekend, uh, I went out with my daughter, took the dog for a walk in the woods. And um, my other, my younger daughter wants me to make her a bow. I made a, a, you know, a, a bow from a sapling for my older daughter once. My younger daughter wanted one too. So we went out for a walk with the dog in the woods, found the right sapling, and I filled it with this. I brought out the Formax Gout. This is, a, this is an AUS 10A blade, a US 10 blade and a knife that uh, was a gift to me from the great and powerful Jimmy Slash. Uh, Jimmy gave this to me after we um, talked about it at length on our deep cut. And uh, he's like, you don't have a Formax? And he's got a huge collection of Formaxes and Formax Scouts. And I, so I guess it was nothing to peel one off and send it to me. And I'm really grateful he did. What a, what a great knife this is. I mean, it's, it's got a four inch blade, but I swear it, it seems bigger. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very, very stout, stout knife. Now this is the, um, what Andrew Demko was thinking for a, um, an AD 10, um, expanded to four inches. And in doing that, he had to curve the handle a little bit so that the handle wouldn't be too long. And, uh, Love this thing. Love this thing. Now, this year, in 2021, Cold Steel is coming out with the Formax Elite, they call it. I'm not sure what makes it elite. It's got S35 VN blade steel, but that's nothing new, um, I don't think. Oh, it's the it's the G10. It's got this uh, different kind of G10, and it's contoured and stuff. So um, we shall see about that. But uh, I got to say, this AUS 10A $50 four max scout or not it's uh, it's a little more than 50 bucks but this thing is it just crushed it i couldn't believe it one swipe and i filled it was about and it was probably it was probably an inch and a half in diameter and just uh breezed right through it and then delimbed it like it was nothing and absolutely no blade play no nothing look at how thick that that blade and that lock are so just an update, the 4MAX Scout is an awesome knife, and uh, I got to use it for the very first time, so psyched about that. i put this thing away before it hurts somebody. Next. This is very exciting for me. The next is from uh, Bark River Knives. Now, this is one of the few knives that I've, uh, I did a waiting list for. And uh, I got on the pre-order for this. This is the Boone 2. And uh, the Boone 1, incidentally, was a, was a four and a half inch blade. This one is a six inch blade. Before I remove the knife, I just, I just want you to note how gorgeous this leather uh, sheath is. It's got one thick welt down you know, in the middle and then two really fat slabs of, of this beautiful full grain leather and then this is a such a cool aspect let me show you this uh, most bark river knives do this uh, if they have this retention strap when you when you undo it so that you don't cut the strap when you remove the blade there's a little notch cut out in the sheath and this just tucks behind there so you don't have to worry about it flopping around getting cut or getting in the way and you can access your knife and use it so you might ask, Whoa, what about this knife? I mean, yeah, it's got a Bowie blade, and we all know I like Bowies. It's got stacked leather handles. I love that. This is 3V, by the way, which is a great steel, but 
honestly, I, I, I wouldn't know it from a, a hill of beans if I had to use it. So it's not the 3V. I'm pleased about that. What is it about this knife that I would uh, get on um, early, uh, get on the pre-order for it? And what it is, is that this is such an American design. So this is based kind of on the marbles ideal or the Wade and Butcher, which was, which was a Sheffield company. You know, Sheffield, England produced a lot of knives that came over here. And this is a um, sort of an iconographic design from the late 1800s. It's sort of a do-all hunting outdoors and fighting utility knife, frankly. The, uh, this was one of the knives, or, or the knife that this is based on, this Boone II, uh, the marbles ideal, was one of the knives that actually went into the design of the K-Bar. Um, so it's sort of a proto K bar in a way. Uh, it's got the stacked leather handle. Beautiful. Now this is a uh, stacked black leather. So it was dyed black. Uh, you've got an aluminum pommel here screwed on to a, what is it? A, a rat tail tang, I guess. And you have the double quillion guards. I believe if you send that, send this back to Bark River Knives, they will grind off the top quillion. If you're someone who does a lot of camp stuff and you have your finger up on the blade or your thumb up on the blade and that top quillion gets in the way, they also recommend a half quillion so you can have it halfway ground down if you like. Uh, I'm not sure if they're actually releasing any or sending any out of the company like that, uh, but it is something that you can do. This knife now, as you know, I have, um, a, you know, I have four Bark River Knives that I, I'm very fond of, and I don't use uh, much at all. Like the two big Bowies, I don't use at all. They're, they're just collection pieces. But this one, I intend to use. This one, um, you know, will will spend its time on my hip mowing the lawn, you know, or whatever, whatever I do in the back, which I live in suburbia. It's nothing big. But, uh, you know, I too have vines to clear. So I, I think this will be my outdoor knife. I want to turn, I want to, I don't know. I want to see. I want to see how 3V does. I want to see how a Bark River knife does. I know it'll do great, but uh, I've always been very precious with them. So this one, I think I'll turn into a a user, and I'm going to throw up the air quotes for that um, because it won't be used hard, and it won't be you know it won't be necessary probably, but it'll be something that I choose. So the Boon Two from Bark River Knives, um, it is out now, and. Uh, so you can check it out. Let's see, I got this at Knives Ship Free. And, uh, you know, it's in a lot of different places. So so check it out. The Boon 2, 6-inch blade. Uh, and, of course, like all Bark River knives, it comes with a, a huge selection of handles. All sorts of beautiful burl woods and, you know, micartas and, and such. So definitely, definitely check that out. And lastly, for the state of the collection, is a modification, not, not, not a modification, an aftermarket delight. So right here, you can see this is my TRM Atom, Three, River, uh, Three Rivers Manufacturing Atom. And it came originally with uh, flat handle slabs made of micarta, just flat handles. So I went on their website and uh, ordered some new scales. They have a bunch of new, a uh, bunch of scales you can get. And uh, so I got a contoured set. If you look at this, it's contoured in cross section, uh, but also it's got this beautiful wing pattern milled in and it really adds grip and, and a little bit of girth to this knife. The TRM Atom is an awesome knife. It's The blade is incredible, very thin and very acute and sharp and broad and 20 CV. And I wasn't carrying it much. And I think it was the flat my Carta slabs were just sort of, eh, they're playing and yeah, comfortable enough, but uh, these scales are gorgeous. Now, uh, I got this in uh, a forest green, and uh, but to me, it reminds me of British racing green. It's like uh, I saw recently that Jake of Bearded Gear got a TRM Adam, and he got it with these scales on it, and he mentioned this, uh, but yeah, it reminds me of the color you used to see Jaguars in. It's like it's like uh, a green with more blue in it than OD green. You know, it's that forest color. And I just love it. And this is the first uh, first knife I have with that color handle. 
So yeah, TRM. And, and a great thing about it is these scales swap out so quickly. All you have to do is remove this screw and this screw. You don't have to worry about the pivot or anything. Just remove those two screws. The scale comes off. You put the new uh, scale on, put the screws in, done. And over here, it's got three screws, those two, uh, two clip screws and this one body screw. And so it took less than five minutes to change the scale on the scales on this knife. So fantastic, outstanding. And uh, I want more. Now it's like uh, dressing up your knife in a new outfit every, every time you get new scales. So thanks, Marianne and TRM. Love that knife. Uh, love those handle scales. So uh, let's talk a little bit about double-edged knives. What do you say? Okay. Well, we're not all allowed to have them. Uh, they are illegal in some places. Uh, where I am, they're legal to own, but I can't really carry them around. And that's fine. I don't need to carry them around. Uh, but they are compelling in, in the fact that they are more uh, bent towards a, a, a weapony sort of uh, application. And as you know, that's always been uh, my primary fascination uh, with knives. It's a way that you can study history. You know, I, I learned this in studying art history. I didn't know much about history until I started studying art history. And I realized, oh, this, this was made during the French Revolution. What's that? And then you kind of look into what the French Revolution is. Well, it's the same thing with knives. Oh, this is an interesting shape. Oh, that's a Bowie knife. Oh, yeah. What's the history behind that? And then you can learn about history in, you know, looking through your knife collection. So this first one <coughs> is very special to me because my brother-in-law gave it to me and he served in Iraq with this. And this is the M8A1 bayonet. And he was in the uh, Marine Corps CAG group, Civilian Affairs, I think it was, where they would go in to towns and win hearts and minds and that kind of thing uh, before the invading force would show up. And um, he also did uh, um, he also did some other specialized stuff. But this is uh, he's got a funny story about this um, about this knife. Um, they would wear these on their belts all the time and. Um, coming in and out of getting out of in and out of Humvees became an issue. But let me tell you, let me preface this by saying this is in 2004. He was in the initial um, invasion of Iraq coming up from Kuwait. Um, so I don't know how the gear changed over the years, but at, at, at the time he was there, he was carrying this and he said it was a real pain in the, in the butt getting in and out of Humvees. This would always get caught on the doors or caught on, uh, on stuff. And so one day they went out uh his civilian affairs group went out. Uh, I don't know what they were doing, but they went to a crowded area to, to do whatever they do. And he decided he wasn't going to wear his knife on that day. Cause man, just what a pain in the butt. And uh, here, I'll take it out so you can see, cause it is double edged on this day, this one day they got to a crowd, the crowd got angry and, uh, it was the one time in his whole period during the war where they had to fix bayonets to keep people back. And he didn't have this with him because it was a pain in the butt to carry. So uh, he was the one guy without a bayonet. And I just think that's kind of a funny story. Funny because I wasn't there. Funny because of time. <laughs> so this has a bayonet grind. Bayonet grind is a double-edged knife where the, um, double, the second edge on the top part comes halfway up. So you got this... You've got this, uh, well, sort of a swedge, and then it's sharpened. This is a very sharp knife, by the way. I've never used it for anything, but uh, I'm so happy to have this. And I'm not sure why he didn't keep it himself, but I'm very honored that he gave it to me. This is cool. This is the uh, to remove it from the lug uh, on the end of a M16 or M4 or whatever they were using. And, uh, yeah, very, very very prized knife in the collection. I think I'll leave these out so we can see them all at a glance. Next is a knife that my brother got me. I've shown this off a lot recently. This is the Fairbairn Sykes. And this is a, an antique. He got it from his, his guy. He, I think he's gotten a number of M1 carbines from and that kind of thing. Um, 
was very sharp. So this uh, this is the Fairbairn Sykes British Commando knife. Uh, it's an iconic design. Everyone knows this. Uh, a lot of interesting things about this knife. It's got a very thin blade, and it was known to bend um, just in in being on someone's person and uh, pressing up against things. This one, as you can see, has a little bit of a bend in it. And uh, when I first got it, my initial thought was to get the bend out. But then I was like, no, first of all, I don't want to break it. Second of all, that's part of its authenticity. You know, um, you can see by looking at the handle at the, at the haste with which these were produced because they had to get to the front lines. So, um, you know, totally utilitarian. They're not worried about fit and fit. Well, they're, they're worried about fit, but they're not so worried about finish, you know, and this incidentally is a is a completely circular handle. So uh, the arguments against the circular handle I mentioned earlier, um, they can turn it in your hand. I think a lot of guys ended up putting their thumb on the blade like this so that they could uh, easily um, orient the blade. Uh, but I guess, you know, you remove it from the sheath, you have a pretty good idea of where it is. But you could see how it could turn itself and unless you have contact with the with the quillions on the guard here, you could lose track of where the edges are and where the flats are. This uh, this British commando knife. Now I've I've handled a lot of what do you call it um, reproductions, and this is very different in that the blade is quite thin and very sharp, very sharp. All the reproductions I've held have been these dull kind of you know they look that they, they got the daggery shape but they're they're like slabs uh of steel and and not very uh effective so uh yeah fairbairn sykes right next to the m a uh, m8 a oops sorry next is this cold steel safekeeper 2 now this is an old one this is right when they started using kydex instead of leather now i can't imagine this knife with a leather sheath uh, wouldn't be very, wouldn't be very hidey and tuck awayable, but this thing is a push dagger, which means you hold it in your hand like this and grip the handle like this and you punch with it or you can slash with it. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. But the point is with this gripped in your hand, it's, a, it's very difficult to disarm. And, and frankly, I would imagine very difficult to fight against. Um, if, if you happen to be a skilled knife fighter and you go up against another guy with a regular knife, there might be things that you've practiced to handle, uh, to handle that, that threat. But this, you know, I don't know, the push daggers seem extra menacing to me. And, uh, I think that they were developed from the, what's the Indian, that big Indian gauntlet knife. Can't remember what that's called. A conjar, con. Hmm. Should have looked that up before we started uh, rolling here. But yeah, I know a lot of uh, the myth goes, and I don't know if this is true or not, but the myth goes that uh, this was a favored knife among uh, riverboat gamblers uh, because it was easy to tuck in the cummerbund, and uh, you know you could you could access it at a at a second's notice and uh, and go to town with it. I, I don't know. I like the myth. I don't know if it's actually true but the push dagger you can't help but look at the push dagger and and let your imagination go wild so next i love the name of this one next is by tops knives designed by lacy zabo this is the felony stop now this is a dagger blade on a very different sort of platform if you look at it it's got a pistol shaped handle so it's got a pistol grip, but a symmetrical dagger hand, uh, dagger blade. Symmetrical from, from the half to the, to the front. Of course, you have this big, beautiful finger swale here for po real positive purchase on your thumb, which is an issue when you have the second the secondary edge so close to your thumb. This deep, deep swale with these really big jimps here allow your thumb to go below the surface of the edge of that second edge. So it'll be on a thrust, very difficult for your thumb to ride up on that secondary edge. Also, 
the pistol grip shape, that curve there, nestles into your palm and pushes against your palm. So on a thrust, I mean, you can jam this into a tree all day. I've done it. Not all day, but, <laughs> and uh, you're, you're not moving. It's, it's that handle and that thumb swale there really keep everything right where it needs to be. Uh, I initially got this knife because I just thought it looked super cool. But uh, in having it and using it, I am not using it. In having it and carrying it, I think that it would be really excellent for its intended purpose, which is self-defense. Um, now, the name is interesting. I initially thought that it was like felony stop, like this is to stop felonies. And that could be. But then I also then I also realized it could be like a felony stop, like like a like a traffic stop that turns into a felony stop. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I like the name. I like the knife a lot. And uh, someone, uh, uh, one of the viewers of this show, got back to me once and said that he had a custom Zabo version of this, which would be very, very cool. Be nice to see this in different uh, uh, colorways. I hate that term, and I just used it. But be cool to see this in different steels and different materials. Uh, I'm a big fan of this knife. The next one is also a tops. This one is the Ranger's Edge. This is a great knife, and you don't see much about it. You got the usual tops sheath with the rotating clip. This thing is okay. I've taken it on and off uh, a couple of times. Uh, it works, and it works to keep the knife in the position you want it in, but it also it also puts the knife a little bit further away from you, um, but whatever. Uh, it's not like I actually carry and use this knife anyway. So this has the black micarta scales and a beautiful dagger blade. Now, I'll tell you what I like about this dagger blade in particular. It's similar to Cold Steel's daggers in that each edge has quite a bit of belly. So you can turn this into a, you know, a slasher as well as a thruster and have it be pretty effective because you have, uh, well, you have, oh, uh, it's wider towards the tip than it is at the Ricasso. So that's going to add to its slashing power. Theoretically, that's very pleasing to me uh, in theory, since this is a weapony kind of knife and I have it in my collection uh, as an example of that, that's what I like about, about that blade shape. Now, it also has these very subtle serrations here, and I haven't tested them. I, I wonder how effective those little serrations would be, and really why they're there. They don't seem especially sharp, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't run them through the, the paces. But I'm a little curious about those uh, serrations. I am not serration by uh biased uh, i mean i guess i prefer not to have serrations on most knives but when i get them i like them and i i have them for for you know for a reason this one it just sort of came with them and i'm not sure what they do <laughs> they don't look very sharp they just look like little notches dinged out of the edge but uh maybe someday i'll find out okay next on my list of favorite double-edged knives in my collection is the attention to detail mercantile double-edged fighter. This is a sheath that my brother made for it. Um, beautiful sheath. My brother does beautiful leather work. This knife. Whew. Uh, let's see. First custom knife, I believe. First custom knife. And uh, I had been watching Douglas Esposito on uh, Instagram for quite a while. And then I got in touch with him and he came on the show a few times. And, and then I finally got this. I went to his, uh, his knife shop and picked it up. I think what did it is I saw him make a knife with tortoise shell. And then I'd been looking at the fighter for a long time. This is, this is his fighter model blade. And as you can see, that's sort of a bayonet edge also. And I bit the bullet and I got it. And, um, it is one of my prized knives. This is S35VN, and I, you cannot feel this, obviously, but the feel of this knife in hand is amazing. It's It's got 
all the way it's it's weighted just right now the balance i guess is right after this choil right after the finger choil and i know a lot of people think the balance on every knife should be right at the at the guard but on a dagger or on a fighting knife double-edged fighting knife you want the weight a little bit further back so that you can move the front easier it's sort of the same concept of a sword how a sword has a big heavy pommel on the end well that weight on the back side of your hand allows you to move the weight on the front side of your hand and four feet out on your on your sword tip allows you to move that quicker. It's the same thing with a, with a knife. It's just scaled down. So the weight is just perfect on this knife. Uh, I, I would imagine that that was intentional. Douglas Esposito is quite a martial artist. Uh, he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. And uh, so he thinks about these things. Beautifully hollow ground, very, very thin. Yeah, this is a, I always kind of think of this as a classy assassin's knife. So, you know, it activates that part of my imagination. Okay, let's move, move along. The next one is one I almost forgot to bring out because it lives on the top of the fridge and has for years. This is my Cold Steel OSS. The OSS is a sub hilt fighter. And what a sub-hilt fighter is, well, a sub-hilt fighter based on the Bob Loveless Big Bear Classic, I think it was called, or Big Bear. And um, when I say sub-hilt, I'm referring to this. Now, if you can't see this, uh, right after the forefinger on the handle, there's a quillion that sticks out. So it looks like half of a guard sticking out of the handle. Your finger goes between the main guard and this secondary quillion, and it allows you a lot of control, uh, not only in terms of pulling it out of a, a target because you have this extra bit of grip, but also in terms of moving the knife around. It gives you more dexterity and nimbleness. This knife is, if you look at it, it's a clip point, but the full back edge is sharp. These are hollow ground. Uh, Cold Steel used to make one called the Black Bear Classic. And it had black micarta handles and aluminum, an aluminum sub hilt, an aluminum guard, and a polished blade. And it came in a, in a black leather sheath. And I never got that. And I regret it because I love this knife. I love sub hilt full, uh, fighters. I think they're just incredibly cool knives. And uh, Cold Steel's version of it, I bet, was awesome. And I'm, I'm bummed that I missed out on it. Uh, so every once in a while, I'll look for one on um, eBay and then stop looking because, you know, they're either not there or they're super expensive because, well, because they're gone now. They're limited. They were kind of limited in production and now they're just, pff, they are no longer. But you can still get the OSS. And I believe they put another like a Warncliffe blade on this also. So you can get this in a couple of different iterations. Oh, and then there's also that the big marauder the bowie that is on the same exact handle but it's a big giant bowie blade the marauder all right three more three more next the black rock monkey thumper i showed this to you just before now this is one that uh ordinarily that's just a harpoon swedge but i i thought uh, in ordering this i thought it looked like it was just dying for a secondary sharpened edge so i asked ken and he said sure I can do that. So this this knife is um, really great. You can see it's set up for a karambit, but you can you can use it in such a way that that is just a nice big pommel, and you can use that for striking and and other such things. But if you do use it as a karambit, the shape of the outside of the ring is so perfect for. I'm not going to do this on camera, but for flipping it around and arresting the motion of the of the karambit as it as it swivels around on your finger so yeah and in this position in the traditional karambit position you have uh you have that point you can punch with and then you have that double edge you can hook with so uh very very happy about owning this custom version of the monkey thumper and i'm really looking forward to ken's success with with the uh, Fox production version of that knife. 
All right, another knife you've seen a lot recently on this show because I got it recently and I've been very, very excited about it. Is this the Spartan Harzi dagger? What do I need to say about this? It, but it's just fantastic. Six inch blade, very sharp, hollow ground, beautifully contoured and milled spiral uh, pattern handle. You've got jimping. You've got a pinched, uh, a pinched handle right up here by the quillions, and uh, that that really nice pommel with the triangular, uh, uh, with the tang protruding in a triangular fashion, so you can smash glass with it and knock noggins with it, whatever you're going to do with it. But uh, really, very happy to finally have this knife in my collection, especially after talking to both Curtis Iavito and to uh, Bill Harsey uh, about other things, but also this knife. I'm just so happy to have it. And if you look closely, you can see the Spartan Blades logo, but you can also see that tree. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I just knocked the camera. You can also see that little green, evergreen tree right next to it. That's, uh, that's Bill Harsey's logo. Bill Harsey grew up in a logging family in the great Northwest. What an interesting and cool guy he is. Uh, yeah, salt of the earth, tough, you know, like they don't make men anymore. I'm just kidding. That's a, that's a line from, we were talking about the Odyssey before. They're always talking about men like they don't make anymore. You know, they talk about their, their ancestors and how stout hearted they were. Okay. So speaking of the ancient world, my very, very last double edge, this is a, this is a bit of a, what do you want to call it? A dark horse. This is my traditional Filipino weapons um, gladius. Actually, Jim, if you would, let's see if it looks all right on this camera over here. Look at that. <laughs> so this was a gift uh, from my brother. Um, he stated, and I, I believe this, he stated all Italian households need to have one of these. And I think I extrapolated out and said, all households need to have one of these. Now, uh, because of that uh, big, uh, what do you call it? Uh, because of the camera angle, it's looking curved, but this is a straight double-edged blade and uh, made down in the jungles of the Philippines uh, by skilled craftsmen who put these traditional Filipino weapons uh, together. Now, they started a few years ago, you know, they have a whole giant uh, panoply of Filipino weapons. A few years back, they started making European weapons and ancient historical weapons. So you can buy a katana from them. You can buy this gladius from them. Uh, I believe they have a broadsword and uh, a bowie that uh, you can you can see a review of their bowie knife uh, on this old blade uh, blade reviews. Dave does one. Just beautiful knives, man. So so they they took it from the Filipino to the European and they're just, uh, they're just taken off. So, uh, that lives next to my bed. That's the sword I grab when someone comes in sword in one hand, something else in the other. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll see what happens, but, uh, hopefully that never happens. But if they do, if it does seeing a gladius coming at you might, might give you pause. Like who is this insane person in their pajamas? coming after me with a gladius. Well, that would be me, people. That would be me. So here they are. It's kind of a messy uh, uh, a messy arrangement here, but, but these are my favorite uh, double-edged knives. I have a few others in the collection, uh, but these are the ones that in, in going, through the, going through what I have really turn me on and represent what I'm looking for in a double-edged uh, double piece like this. So if you want to see these, these are all broken out into reviews on YouTube. You should definitely check them out. You can check out the Sunday interview shows on YouTube. You can check out Thursday Night Knives live every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. And then you can check out the knife reviews. I've been putting out mm, three or four a week. Uh, we have a video coming out on YouTube every day. Sometimes it's a podcast like this, and sometimes it's just a straight-up knife review video. Uh, but 
go to YouTube. If I mean, I guess you're already here, but uh, if you're listening to this, check us out on YouTube and subscribe. And see uh, see what we do on a regular basis here. You might like it. So uh, I think we're gonna wrap it right there. And uh, you just take good care of your knives, you know. And if you keep them around uh, in in years and years later, you'll you'll have your memories stored up in these things. And that's an aspect of this hobby that uh, is really pleasing to me and uh, kind of makes it seem worthwhile. It could be a way that could help you remember your life. And that's my story and I'm sticking with it. So for Jim, my good buddy, working his magic behind the switcher and for myself who today am wearing a don't take dull for an answer t-shirt designed by my good friend, Jim. Check this out, guys. Definitely go check these out. Here, you can see right there. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash dull2 for the black t-shirts and sweatshirts and merch and all sorts of stuff. Or uh, thenifejunkie.com slash dull for the white stuff. And uh, so it's all, it's the same logo with white backgrounds. Don't take dull for an answer. All right, there you have it. So you won't hear me say it again today. Thanks a lot for joining us for this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast midweek supplemental where we talked about double-edged knives and other things. It's been a real pleasure and we appreciate your viewing. So uh, until next time, I'm Bob and he's Jim and we're saying take care. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.